Hello everyone and welcome to or welcome back to the channel tonight. We're going to do a little bit of catch up on these previews for the Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Starting off with Salvala Eagle Trailblazer here on the screen. Two, a green and a white. It's a 4-5 L Scout with Vigilance. Whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one Mercenary Creature Token with tap. Target creature gets a plus one plus zero until end of turn and you can only activate that as a sorcery. Or tap and choose a color, add one mana for each color of the different powers among creatures you control. So this kind of works in with the Coven ability from the Innistrad sets back a couple years ago. Really good. This card was leaked a few weeks back. It was in a pre-release uh, kit that somebody had opened and put it online. So we kind of knew this one was coming. Pretty good card. Uh, I can see this seeing some kind of play in like a creature spam deck. I'm going to give it a try and see if I can generate a bunch of extra tokens off of it to see if we can come up with like a little bit of an overrun style effect and go from there. Then we have Bonnie Powell clear cutter for three, a green, blue, blue. It's a six, five giant scout with reach. When Bonnie Powell clear cutter enters the battlefield, create bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. And whenever you attack, draw a card, and then you can put a land card from your hand onto the, or the graveyard even, onto the battlefield. So here's your Paul Bunyan analog that's here that creates the blue cow along with your uh, giant lumberjack. So this one's kind of cool, but it's kind of just a generic Simic type, I don't even call it value engine, basically draw cards, get value out of it kind of thing. Eh, I'm just kind of not really into that kind of thing anymore. Then we have Satoru the Infiltrator for a blue and a black. You get a 2-3 human ninja rogue with menace. It says whenever it and or one or more other non-token creatures enter the battlefield under your control, if none of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. So this is looking at free spells, spells that you have flickered out of play, spells that are, you know, there's just there's a bunch of different things that you're doing here with this that you can try to get the extra cards off of them. Now, it's not like super powerful. Yeah, you're getting cards, but you kind of have to really work to get those cards. So it's kind of, it's kind of a toss up. This could be really, really stupidly good, or it could be just kind of mediocre. I'm not sure yet. Then we have the return of an old legend from the some of the earliest precons in Magic the Gathering for Riku of the Many Paths for a green, a blue, and a red. It's a 3-3 human wizard whenever you cast a modal spell. So this makes this the first time it's ever mentioned in a on a card about modal spells. Choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. Exile the top card of your library, and until the end of your next turn, you may play it. Put a plus one plus one counter on Rico of the many paths against trample until end of turn or create a one one blue uh, blue bird creature token with flying. So obviously you want to have something that you can pick three or more modes on when you cast it other than just one. So you're looking at things that have like the kicker abilities on them to add multiple mode choices on there. You're wanting to have ones that say, you know, choose up to three of this one thing or whatever. There's a lot of cards that do these kind of effects, including the new spree abilities that are on the cards that come in the set. So that's kind of like the build in for this. But we do have some older modality cards that can work with this as well. So I would keep an eye on this. This could be a very good thing. And there's probably going to be some of the older modality spells that are going to go up in price in these colors because they work really well with what he's doing. Then next up is Marquesa, Dealer of Death, a blue, a black, and a red. It's a 3-4 human rogue. Whenever you commit a crime, you may pay one. If you do, look at the top two cards of your library, put one in your hand, one into the graveyard. So this card is stirring up a bunch of idiotic debate, in my opinion, online about why a queen from another world would bother coming here. And, you know, it's probably out of boredom. Who knows? That's not the idea here behind this. What I like here is the gameplay that it presents. And this is kind of good for graveyard centric decks, any kind of decks that you want to have the good card selection as you're digging through things and committing a crime is really, really easy. All you gotta do is target something that's going on on your opponent's side of the board or themselves and you get a crime trigger. That's why a lot of these cards have, you, this can only happen once per turn. It's strapped onto them. That's how easy it is to do. 
Luckily, this is one of the few that they have so far that does not have that limitation attached to it. So there's going to be ways to try and bend and break this card where you're digging through your deck at rapid fire pace, putting big things into the graveyard to resurrect later. So I would keep an eye on this one too. This could come up with some good reanimator shenanigans in the future. Moving away from the legends here, we have a, a just a basic card, Outcast or Trailblazer for two in a green. You get a 4-2 human druid. When it enters the battlefield, add one mana of any color. Whenever another creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card and it plots for two in a green. And if you don't remember what plot is, if you didn't see my first video or you haven't been paying attention, plot means you just exile it face up outside of the game. And then on a later turn, you can cast it at sorcery speed for that, for no cost additional. So everybody likes to play, and I personally like to play, Garuk's Uprising. Enters the play, if you have something four or bigger, you draw a card. And then as you play four or bigger creatures, you draw more cards. So it's basically Garuk's Uprising on a stick without granting the trample part of the card, which is kind of important. A little more fragile, but it's nice to have redundancy in a deck. So if you need to have an extra way to draw cards, this is a nice little piece of redundancy. And the plot is nice on this because it rips it out of your hand, just like a foretell would, so that it can't be discarded by your opponents doing things that they're doing. So that's one of the cool things I like about plot is that it protects the cards, even though they can see what it is. Cause there's some of these spells that you, you actually have to declare what it is to get an effect off of the plotting. So it is face up. They will know this is coming and it is at sorcery speed, but again, it protects it from those discard effects. So that I like. Then back to our legendary creatures with Bristly Bill Spine Sower for one and a green 2-2 mythic plant druid with landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one on target creature, most likely probably himself, unless you have something better to do with because 2-2 is kind of fragile. And then three green green, double the number of plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. Plus one plus one counter decks will love this card. They will want this card. It's almost an auto include in those kind of decks. And there is a card that was revealed today that goes really well with this guy. And we'll talk about him in just a little while. But this card, I, like I said, this is going to fit any kind of commander decks that are a green and B wants plus one, plus one counters. So I can see this probably being a good eight to $10 card. If it's popular enough with those type of builds. And if it gets good in standard or any other format, it's going to get even more expensive. And speaking of expensive, we have a reprint and a much needed reprint in Terror of the Peaks for three red red. It's a dragon, five, four flyer, mythic. Spells your opponents cast that target the terror cost an additional three life to cast. So it's a ward ability. And whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target this card right now is 45 dollars as of this recording for the 2021 core set edition that came out back in 2020 this is kind of stupid and it's only the only reason this card costs this much is because it was printed in a set that was printed at the height of the pandemic stores were closed people were not buying sealed product they were not opening it in mass in drafts and seals and all this other stuff so this card is actually very limited on supply and it's in a very popular creature type and it's a very good card now that's not to say that this is not going to it's not going to crater the price i'll tell you that much right now one, it's a mythic, and two, the most recent sets like Thunder Junction and the Murders at Karlov Manor, they're being under-opened. Players are upset for one various reason or another, and there's a lot of complaining online about this set, just like there was with the Murders at Karlov Manor. And I get the feeling this set will be under opened. So there's going to be less of it out on the market for the singles buyers to get their hands on. So my guess is this will probably fall down to about a 15 to $20 card unless the set is so popular. People start opening it in mass. Then it might be a little bit lower than that. But if this comes out and you see the price dip around that $15 mark and you want a copy of it, I would say jump on it as quickly as you can because it will go back up. Then we have a card that I feel is kind of a secondary version or maybe even a replacement version of things like Read the Bones and things like that. Unscrupulous Contractor, two and a black, human assassin, three, two. So you get an assassin to work with your assassin decks, like the Atrata deck that I showed off a few weeks back. 
When unscrupulous contractor enters the battlefield, you can sacrifice a creature. If you do, target player loses two life and draws two cards, and you can plot it for two and a black. So you can kind of plan ahead, again, exile it, put it out of your hand, and then you can cast it later when you have a creature available to sacrifice to get the trigger if you're, if you're lacking that on turn three. And then the nice part here is you get a 3-2 body, you get the same effect as those card draw spells that make you lose two, draw two. And the nice part here too is you can force somebody else to draw these cards as well. So you can use it as a burn spell if you need to as well, which works really nice with things like, oh, I don't know, Shield of the Apocalypse. Hello. Then we have a fun removal spell. Now I'd say this is fun for a couple of reasons, but the primary one is the reminder text on the card. And I'll read it out loud and you'll kind of get a laugh because it's the only card that has this kind of thing on it. It's shoot the sheriff for one in a black, destroy target, non-outlaw creature. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are outlaws. Everyone else is fair game. I find that to be highly hilarious. Now, I mentioned this online to a couple people I know that I think this is going to be a trap card in limited. Like it looks like it's good removal because cheap removal is very valuable in a limited like sealed and draft formats. However, there's so many outlaw creature types that they've already shown off and the set hasn't even been fully revealed that I think this is going to be a trap in those things. And depending on your play group, this may or may not be good. Like if your deck, if people are like pulling together the pre-cons, like the Olivia pre-con is going to have a bunch of outlaws in it or they're just going to build an outlaw centric deck on their own. This card's junk because you're going to lose all the targets that this thing can hit in those particular decks. But otherwise, if your playgroup doesn't really gravitate towards these creature types, this is actually pretty good removal and it's an uncommon, so it'll be really easy to get your hands on a copy of it. And then next up is one of my favorite spells I've seen so far. If you've watched, I love Irenicus's Vile Duplication, and this has that ability strapped onto it at instant speed too. For a blue plus the one of the spree triggers, you get one of three things. You can either cancel, so one blue, blue counter target spell, it's cancel. For three and a blue, you get Irenicus's Vile Duplication, except for it doesn't do the legendary removal thing. So you create a copy of target artifact or creature you control. Great card. And then two and a blue, draw two, discard two. So you get a divination attached to it. So this has a lot of things going on for it. And you can, of course, mix and match the modes. So you could you know, reasonably go, you know, one blue or uh, what is it? Four blue, blue, you know, counter a spell and make a copy of something. That's, there's just dumb things you can do there. So I like the, I love the flexibility of this card and I think it will see a lot of play in a lot of formats. Now this spree spell is just kind of silly shenanigans, which I love doing chaos and shenanigans stuff in commander. This is shining grift for blue, blue. You pick a spree mode on there for, so for two blue, blue, you exchange two creatures that are controlled. So you can flip either two other players, things around, or you can flip around yours with somebody else. For one blue, blue, you get two artifacts that you can flip control. And for one blue, blue, you can exchange uh, enchantments that you control. Now it's that, and you'll note it doesn't say anything about non auras or non equipments or anything you know funny like that. So you could you know use like a exile removal spell like a banishing light or you know uh, an aura like a pacifism effect. And then flip the control to them and steal, I don't know, their doubling season or whatever they might have on the other side of the board. So they gain control of the pacifism that's on their own creature and you get their, you know, doubling season or whatever. It's kind of silly. I like this kind of thing. So that's why I like this card and I bring it up here. And another one of those silly type cards that I really like here is ways of either cloning or pseudo cloning in the case of this card. It's fleeting reflection for one in a blue. It's an instant target creature you control gains hexproof until end of turn. Untap the creature until end of turn. It becomes a copy of up to one other target creature. Now, note this says not stuff that you control. It's any other creature. So you can actually go ahead hexproof in response to something or you don't even have to use that part of the spell. You can use it just to turn something over and then use it as a way to block and destroy. Like something has death touch. You can copy one of their death touchers and then throw it in front of their big thing and kill it. You can do weird combat since it's instant. You can do weird combat tricks where they're like, oh, okay, I'll block this guy. I'll let that guy through. And then you're just like, oh, I'll make it a copy of this big trampling guy that you went let through. So then it right, like the little thing they thought they were going to kill turns into like a six, six trampler runs over their creature and hits them anyways. So there's some cool combat trickery in multiple formats that you could do that with, with this kind of card. 
Then we have a really flexible white spell that I really like here. It's Aven Interrupter. For one white, white, you get a Flash Flyer 2-2 that when it enters the battlefield, exile target spell, it becomes plotted. And then spells your opponent's cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. So it doesn't matter if it's a plot spell or not. If they have something in exile that they're trying to cast, foretell spells or whatever, this is going to tax them as well for that. But what's neat about this is it protects your spells as well. So say you go to cast something and you leave up the white, one white, white, and they go to counter your spell. You just even interrupt her and you bring that spell either back into, or you just you, know, you throw it into exile. It's, it's plotted or you nail their counter spell and exile it and it becomes plotted. And then it becomes useless because you think you only plot as a sorcery. You can't instant speed, you know, react with a counter spell when it's exiled out of play like that. So this has a lot of dumb uses or just again, if they, you know, they're going to cast something that's going to wreck your day, you just cast this, set it off to the side, and then they have to pay two more to try to get it out of exile. So there's a lot of fun things for this one, too. I love it. Then we have the return of a fan favorite creature. This is Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher for two, a red and a white. It's 4-3 Human Warrior. Oxen you control have double strike. I'm hoping, I'm hoping we have some kind of errata on Oxen for some creatures to become this. Whenever Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher, enters the battlefield or attacks, exit the top card of your library. If it's a land, you can create a 2-2 white ox creature token. Otherwise, you can cast the spell until your end of your next turn. So you don't have to have the mana available right away. You can do it on the next turn. And why is that all? Sorry about that. I just noticed my Photoshop was acting. That's what I'm using as my little preview mode here. So this is kind of fun. You get to have the whole cow thing. And somebody pointed out in the art, if you look at the cow on the left with the red eyes and then on the other side, it's Vigor and Ox of Agonis in the art. So I thought that was kind of a fun little callback. And if they go through and errata a bunch of the things that look like oxes and cows and give them that ability rather than saying they're a, you know, a beast or whatever, because if I remember right, Vigor is an elemental incarnation. It's not actually a cow or an ox or whatever. So they might, maybe they'll go back and errata him. I don't know. And then the next card is at knife point one, a black and a red. It's an enchantment that as long as it's your turn, outlaws you control have first strike. Whenever you commit a crime, create a one, one mercenary creature token. So this is cool for a couple of reasons. One, and this, but the bad part is this only triggers once a turn. It's good if you want to make an outlaw deck. So you're going to give all your outlaws first strike just on your turn. But then as you commit crimes, as long as you have a way to repeatedly commit crimes, you can go ahead and get repeated triggers on each player's turn, not just your own. Now, one card that I've pointed out that does a really good job of this and we're in black is withered wretch withered wretch is a two, two zombie that you pay one and eat a card out of a graveyard. So each turn you just, you know, you attack a graveyard, you get a mercenary token and then you can build up these mercenaries on your side of the board. And if you have enough ways to get these things out or you have things like impact tremors where you deal damage when creatures come into play, just, there's a lot of things you can benefit from, or, you know, just creatures to sacrifice because Rakdos sacrifice is a big thing. There's neat ways to really mess with this stuff and do good things with this whole commit a crime thing that they're trying to pull off. Then we have a new wheel effect, which I absolutely adore, and I will be getting a copy of this for my Locust God deck. Step Between Worlds is three blue-blue sorcery. Each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who does that draws seven cards, exile Step Between Worlds, and you can plot it for four blue-blue. So it costs you a little bit more to plot it and hang on to it. But you can save that mana later for, you know, protecting it like with a counter spell to make sure that it resolves. So this is kind of fun. Like I said, they, my Locust God deck loves wheel effects. I, I keep looking for more and more good ones. So, yeah, this will be a good one to stick in there. Um, maybe you can't afford to get copies of uh, some of the more expensive wheels. This would be a good step between that, <laughs> pun intended. So you can go ahead and try to, you know, get this into your decks. I like this card. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, moving on to the cards that were revealed on Thursday, it's the Forsaken Miner. It's a black 2-2 camp block skeleton rogue. If you commit a crime, pay black and return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. Somebody's already, you know, realized that there's an infinite combo with Phyrexian Altar and Blood Artist, which, you know, Phyrexian Altar would, you know, combo with a ham sandwich. But there's not much effort to be put into this. 
But the idea is you sack this to the altar to make the black mana. The blood artist will ping them for this, and then you've committed a crime. So then you can use the black mana to bring this back, cycle, repeat until all your opponents are dead. So this is going to be in some kind of, you know, black infinite sacrifice ping combo stuff in certain commander decks. Um, might get frowned upon for doing so, so do so at your own risk. So I apologize for the quality of this image. I could not find a higher resolution image by the time I was trying to get this thing recorded. It's Rise of the Varmints for three and a green. It's a sorcery that creates X21 green varmint creature tokens where X is the number of creatures in your graveyard. And you can plot it for two and a green so you can kind of, you know, plan ahead. Now this, this would be great in things like the Micro Tyrant decks or anything that you want to do like reanimator where you're just dumping stuff like uh, old stick fingers or stuff like that, where you're trying to dump a bunch of stuff in the graveyard. So then you can, you know, just launch this and create a bunch of two ones on the battlefield for you to go ahead and overrun your opponent on a, like a finisher turn or whatever. Uh, great with like concordant crossroads where you can give them haste. There's a lot of ways to use this card and I really like anything like that. I want a copy of it for my Chatterfang squirrel deck because as you make a bunch of these things on the board, you know, you go ahead and make it that. Cause I have like spider cards, like spider spawning and stuff that I run in that deck every once in a while for equal, you make spiders equal to what's in your graveyard. And so this is just a good kind of almost like an upgrade for the most part, because those things actually cost more, but I can cast this for free basically if I plot it and just sit on it for a while. Now, remember when I was talking about the cactus, there was a card that was coming later on that I wanted to talk about that goes really well with him. Well, here it is. And this card is probably going to be expensive because it is really dang good. This is rare. Ugh. This is Railway Brawler for three green green. It's a five five rhino warrior with reach and trample. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, it put X plus one plus one counters on it where X is its power and it plots for three and a green. So anytime you cast a creature, it comes in with counters on it where it's equal to the power of the creature. So if you drop a 3-3, three, three, it's a 6-6 six, six coming in. And that just gets exacerbated by all the counter doubling that we have available to us in mono green or just any other green variant deck that deals in plus one, plus one counters. Doubling season, you know, there's just all these things that could do this. This could get completely busted and out of control. And I expect this card to draw a lot of attention in Commander. Probably not going to be that great in Standard or any other format, but Commander players are going to eat this thing up. Now, I know this card looks a little funky. It's because I actually doctored a photo up of this one. This was in French. It was the highest quality I could find on it. And I was like, okay, fine. I will just erase the crap underneath of it and take the text off of it and put and fill in the translation so it looks at least okay this is seraphic steed for a green and a white it's a 2-2 unicorn mount with first strike and lifelink whenever it attacks if it was saddled create a 3-3 white angel creature token with flying and it saddles for four so the main reason i bring this one up is because i just played that deck last week using the unicorn commander lathiel and i'm going to pick up a copy of this for my daughter to put in her deck and i just think it's kind of fun and cute so i wanted to show it off but i couldn't find a good copy of the stupid thing to show on camera so i kind of had to make it up then we have pillage the bog for black and green you look at the top x cards of your library where x is twice the number of lands you control put one in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order and it plots for one a black and a green so we have in alchemy type format in arena, the two cast tutor that lets you tutor through the first like third of your deck or whatever for a card. Well, this is kind of in the same vein because if you launch this off on like turn four or five, when most of the time you'd be doing this kind of thing, you're going to be looking through about the top third of your deck because you're going to be doing twice the number of lands. So, you know, if you're doing the top eight to 10 cards, when you launch this off, you're getting a good chunk of your deck out of the way anyway. So this is almost not quite almost an analog to an alchemy card, which I kind of like, it's kind of fun. And then you could also just save it for later. You just, you know, plot it out. And then as you build up your lands, cause you're in black and green, you should be able to ramp out multiple lands. So if you have 10 lands on the board. You look at the top 20 cards of your deck and you're like, holy crap, here we go. Then we have a good vampire for any kind of vampire decks. Doesn't matter what color combination it has black in it. Vadmir New Blood for one in a black 2-2 two, two vampire rogue. Whenever you commit a crime, put a counter on him. It only triggers once a turn. And as long as it has four or more counters on it, it has menace and lifelink. 
Well, again, we've already shown that committing a crime is not that hard, and then you can do this on each player's turn, so you're able to go ahead and stack those counters up. As long as you have a way to attack your opponent, mess with their graveyard, whatever, on each turn, ping them, sacrifice something, drain them with a blood artist, whatever, you've committed a crime, this will get a counter, and it will grow in size, and then it becomes a menacing, life-linking pain for your opponents. It can do so pretty quickly, so I think this is going to be a very good card Commander, standard probably could be pretty good, especially if you have good ways of doing crime committing. Uh, it would be good in an outlaw deck because it is a rogue, so it does count as an outlaw. There's a lot of good uses for this card. Now, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the ever-living crap out of this name, and I'm sorry if it offends anybody. Ty Joaquin, perfect shot for a red and a white. It's a 2-3 human merc. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to a creature equal to that creature's toughness, draw a card. X and tap. If a source you would control would deal non-combat damage to a permanent or a player this turn, it deals that much damage plus X instead. So you can kind of adjust your damage output as needed. So say you have a shock in hand, but they have a four toughness creature. You can pay two into the X plus the shock mana. So for three mana and tapping her, you can blast a four toughness creature with a shock, kill it, get a card off of it, and then, you know, have it out of the way. Or you know, you could always just use this as a way to bolster some other damage that's coming across the plate. There's a lot of versatility with this card, and it's kind of neat to see a Boros commander that's not about equipment. <laughs> let's, put, let's put it this way. I'm happy to see that they're not just shoving another equipment commander at us. This is kind of nice. So I want to try this one out and see what we can do with it. The next up is Lila, Undefeated Slick Shot. For one, a blue and a red, you get a human rogue with prowess. It's a 3-3 that whenever you cast a multicolored instant or sorcery spell from your hand, you exile the spell instead of putting it into the graveyard as it resolves, and if you do, it becomes plotted. So you get two uses out of any multicolored spell that you cast while Lila's on the board, plus she has prowess. This will probably be a good bookend card to put with that otter that they revealed for, that's coming in Bloomborough in the fall because it's a prowess thing and it ha gives your creatures prowess. So if you were to play those together, this would have prowess prowess, just like that jackal from March of the Machine. So this is kind of fun. I like this. I want to try this out. got to see how many multicolored red blue spells we have that are really good aside from Prismari Command. And uh, what is the other one? Um, <laughs> the, the blue red that makes you look at three cards, put one in your hand, one in your grave. I can't even remember the card right now. It's so late, but that would be good in here as well. So this one seems like it has some promise and at least commander, maybe even some use in standard once they get the rest of the set revealed. And once they get Bloomborough revealed to go with that uh, otter, we'll see how this one goes. Then we have the leader of the Sterling Company, Baron Bertram Greywater, for two, a white and a black. You get a Vampire Noble 3-4 that whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 one, one black Vampire Rogue creature token with lifelink, but it only triggers once a turn. And then you can pay one and a black, sacrifice another creature artifact, draw a card. So this ties into a lot of the stuff where it's like you commit a crime, you get a token like that mercen that. Uh, one that creates the mercenaries every turn, but it only triggers once a turn. So if you played a Mardu deck with him and that other card, that enchantment, you could commit a crime, get the outlaw token, the mercenary token, and then get the one, one vampire rogue as well. So you're getting two mercenaries or uh, two outlaws for the price of one, basically in that case. So this is pretty cool. Um, I just, I hate that stupid only resolves once a turn thing it's attached to it we've had other things that do exactly this where whenever one or more tokens into the battlefield under your control you get something off of it why did they have to limit it ah come on make it a rare and then don't limit it and next is a card that i really thought was like weird at first then i'm like wait oh this kind of does stuff that i like this is a removal spell that turns your creatures into what was removed which is super cool this is assimilation ages for one, a white and a blue, it's an equipment that when it enters, you exile a creature until the Aegis leaves the battlefield. And then it whenever it becomes attached to a creature for as long as it's attached to it, the creature becomes a copy of the exiled creature. So if your opponent's like, okay, I'm going to slam, you know, the 6-6 six, six trampling first striking monster on the board, you're just like, Aegis it. Oh, my guy's now the Aegis. Or like your guy. It's like, What? <laughs> I love this. This is really cool. I can't wait to try this out. It just sucks that it's in blue-white, which is one of my least favorite color combinations in almost any combination of colors. But I, I still will give it a whirl. 
Then we have a Outlaw Lords card that they included in the set. Hellsper Boss. I can't even say it right. Hellsper Posse Boss for two red red. It's a two four lizard rogue. So it's actually the lizard in the front. That's the card. I almost I almost thought it was a person riding something. It's the guy in the front here. Other outlaws you control have haste. And then whenever it enters the battlefield, create two mercen one one mercenary tokens. So this gives you the ability to activate those mercenary tokens to pump something on the turn it comes into play. So, and you can use those two mercenaries to pump him up into being a 4-4 essentially. So that's kind of good. Um, if you're going to play the Outlaw deck, great. This is going to work out. Otherwise, this is probably not a very good card. Then we have the next of Oko's gang from the story. It's Karavik the Punisher for one black black human warlock 3-3 three, three. whenever you commit a crime. Exile up to one target black card from your graveyard and copy it. You may cast the copy, and if you do, you lose two life. This does not have a cap on it. So if you can commit crimes repeatedly and you have the ability to pay the life, you can go ahead and cast those copies. Now you have to pay for the copies. You don't just get them. You don't cast them without paying their mana cost. So you have to have the mana for whatever you've exiled. You cast it from your gra the copy from the graveyard and you lose the two life. So don't make that mistake. I've done that before on things thinking it was free. And it's like, no, it's not. So all in all, this is pretty good. I don't know how popular it's going to be because commander players don't really like exiling stuff from their own graveyard. They prefer just doing it out of other people's graveyards. So we'll see how this one goes. So we already saw Gisa the other day, and here's her brother Garalf, the flesh right for two and a blue. You get a human warlock, two, three, that whenever you cast a spell during your turn, other than the first spell each turn, that turn, create a two, two blue, black zombie rogue creature token. And whenever a zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter for each other zombie that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. So what's nice about this is you're able to play, you know, little two drop, one drop zombies ahead of this. And then when you cast your, you know, your next one, you're going to get a two, two, and then you're going to get another two, two. And it, it, you know, as you go through, you're going to get this thing. So you're going to get the, you're going to get multiple two twos. If you can spam multiple spells and those zombies enter with a plus one, plus one counter that stagger steps up for each zombie that entered under the control of that turn. So while interesting, I can't see this it being a commander because mono blue zombies is a, terrible deck there's just not enough good blue zombies almost all of them are exclusively in black or they're blue black take your pick so unless you're going to rule zero this with the, the sister and play them as a blue black deck i just i'm not sure that you're gonna get much mileage out of this as being a zombie commander i could be wrong i could be just completely off my rocker and i will be happy to have somebody prove me wrong on that but for now I would play him in the 99 of a blue black zombie deck and leave it at that. Then we have Kellen's join up card for Bant colors, legendary enchantment. When Kellen joins up, enters the battlefield, you can exile a non land card with mana value three less from your hand and it becomes plotted. So then you get to cast it for free later. And then whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So yeah, this is definitely going to get slotted into things like the um, Joda, the Unifier decks, and any kind of Legendary Creatures Matter decks that you might want to try to tie this into. Bant Colors, I don't know. There, we already have things like the Broker's Ascendancy and stuff like that that puts plus one, plus one counters on all of our creatures. Doesn't care about Legendary Creatures, so I'm not sure where this comes in. And getting one free three-mana spell probably isn't that great in the first place. So I'm not sure how much play this may see outside of maybe that you know, Joe to the unifier deck. Now this one, I couldn't find anything and I didn't have time to rip it apart and redo it. Like I did that unicorn. So we'll just go with this one. It's combo stern mare for one, a white and a black. You get a two, four human advisor. Whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under an opponent's control, you create a tapped copy of each of them. It only triggers once turn. And then whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So the thing here is, say they bring a bunch of tokens into play all of a sudden off of a spell like the, um, the one I showed a little while ago, the Varmints. And they make five tokens. Okay, so you're going to get five copies of those. But you're only getting one life drain trigger because it, it's one or more you get the one, lose one, gain one trigger. 
and this only happens once a turn. So, it, you know, it's kind of like the crime cards. But if you have a way to create tokens off turn, like all your opponents are doing off turn stuff, each time they do it, you're going to get something. And this counts treasure tokens, blood tokens, creature tokens, whatever tokens they're making, you will get a copy of them and they will drain life on there as long as it's not already triggered once before. So I would say uh, take that Dockside Extortionist, but they might have already gotten the Extortionist off by the time this hits the battlefield. So I'm not sure, but this could be kind of fun in the right setup. And then we have Girid Mirror of the Wilds for red, green, white. Uh, this was a commander in one of the pre-cons a few years back. It's a human shaman, 3-3 with haste. Non-token creatures you control have tap, create a token that's a copy of target token you control that enter the battlefield this turn. So all of your creatures can copy a token. So you kind of need kind of need to have an extra piece here to make this work and copy something or dump a you know dump a token on the board and then tap your non-token stuff to make more token copies. So there's there's some extra hoops to jump through with this one. I'm not sure how good it's going to be. I'm going to try to make it work really nice out here, but uh, I'm I'm kind of on the fence at how well this could work. It could be really stupid good, especially with, you know, token doublers. And then you're able to do some other weird stunts. It just depends on what kind of tokens we can get or if there's a way to make token copies of our creatures, but we're not in blue, which is usually the color that does that kind of thing. So we'll give it a whirl, see what it does, and I will let you know how, when that deck is ready to go. But for now, that's all I have. This is from my kind of catch up from Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, not quite sure when this one's going to hit YouTube, so I'll keep you guys informed when I find out more stuff about the set as they come across my desk. In the meanwhile, if you like what I'm doing here, please like, comment, share, subscribe. All those things help my channel grow as I'm trying to get to my first thousand subscribers. And as always, thank you for watching. Have a great day, and I will see you in the next video.